Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm particularly grateful to all of you that you walked away from all those treats and donuts and all that stuff down the hall to come back here uh, to hear me. So uh, thank you for doing that. And, and thank you so much for, for all the good work that you do. Uh, I haven't met all of you, but I've met a lot of you uh, uh, over the years and, and more recently because I have been focusing a lot on agriculture recently. And, uh, and I'm so impressed with uh, your vision for what we can do uh, to clean up our nation's waters through using uh, things like cover crops and focus on soil health and practices that really work uh, for agriculture and really work for the environment. And, and that's why I'm here. I'm very excited about the possibilities that we have. Uh, frankly, I'm looking for something that's transformational. Uh, and, uh, and I think that we may have it here. And so um, I'm really delighted to be here. I want to I wanna thank the sponsors of the conference. I want to thank USDA and the SARE program. And I want to thank uh, uh, the Howard Buffett Foundation. This is wonderful to bring all these people together. And, uh, and I really like the fact that there are people across the country, not just here in Omaha, that are also meeting today to talk about these issues and what are the barriers, what are the opportunities, and how can really do something together to make a big difference. And so, uh, so I'm, I'm just uh, uh, pleased to be here with you today. So I have a couple colleagues here. Katie is right here. Katie Fleha, stand up Katie. And Erica Larson is right next to her. Those are my two colleagues from, uh, from EPA uh, headquarters in Washington where I work. Uh, and they are both uh, experts in agriculture and water issues in a way that I would say I'm not, but I'm, I'm here to learn. Uh, so please talk with them or with me uh, uh, about how we can work better together. So, um, so let me just start with um, what uh, my boss, the administrator, Gina McCarthy, had to say. She, this was from the Iowa State Fair last, uh, last summer, and I was there with her. Um, and uh, the, the photo is there uh, with Bill Kauser from The Cattlemen, for those of you who know, who know Bill. Uh, and this is what she had to say, EPA's mission to protect public health and the environment depends in part on our relationships and partnerships with farmers and ranchers. We share a concern about the quality of air, water, and land that nourish the food, fiber, and fuel they grow and that support their livelihoods. Uh, she has indicated very clearly that she wants a strong partnership with agriculture, that she wants uh, the agency to be figuring out how to work better uh, to achieve our common objectives. That, so that's the, that's the commitment from the top and from the administrator. Uh, and that, again, is part of why I'm here today. So, so what's going to be successful? What's going to be successful is a partnership that is built on common interests and common objectives and that works for everybody in it. It's true of a marriage. It's true of every other partnership you have in life. So what we're looking for at EPA, what I'm looking for in particular, are uh, the, the practices, the treatments, the systematic approach that's going to work for farmers across the country and achieve their goals in terms of uh, staying on the land, which is really important from a water quality standpoint, uh, achieving their economic goals, and achieving the water quality goals that we want and desire as a nation. So that's the partnership I'm looking for. That's the path to success. If you look at that picture, you'll notice they're pretty far out there. Uh, they haven't quite made it over there to the success block on the right. One of my favorite quotes is from Will Rogers, who said, go out on a limb. That's where the fruit is. Uh, right? You remember that? None of us are old enough to really remember Will Rogers, I think. But, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I, I mean, he was a man with a lot of wisdom, Will Rogers. And, and, and you know, that's where we got to be out there on the limb, because that's where the fruit is. But, uh, but we need to support each other as we're moving out there, and that's what the folks in the, in the picture are doing. So, 
So one of the reasons is I told you that I'm so interested in being here, and that is that's because the nutrient pollution problem in this country is bad, and in a lot of places it's getting worse, not better. So, uh, so we really need a breakthrough. We need to find some new strategies, the old strategies of addressing nutrient pollution. And we did address a lot of it as a nation. Uh, uh, the construction grants program under the Clean Water Act that built the sewage treatment plants across the United States did a, a huge amount for reducing nutrient pollution. Um, uh, but uh, we can't succeed just by addressing sewage treatment plants. Uh, we have to address agriculture. We have to address urban runoff in order to succeed. Uh, and so that's a problem I'm focusing a lot of. We focus more on nutrient pollution than any, any other single issue in the Office of Water. And it's because the problem is so pervasive. So here's a few statistics about it, uh, about how big the problem is. And uh, um, uh, 99,000 river miles threatened or uh, impaired, more than 3 million lake acres, 78% of assessed coastal waters show uh, signs of eutrophication. Uh, and drinking water violations have doubled uh, in the past decade. And for the first time that I'm aware of ever, there was a drinking water treatment plant last summer that had to close because of the microcystin from toxic algal blooms that remained in the water after treatment. That happened in Ohio last summer. And so we're starting to see these impacts, not just the, the uh, algal blooms, the green mats uh, that have affected recreation and swimming and so forth over the years, but now drinking water as well. Uh, and of course, um, well water, particularly in agricultural areas, uh, is often affected. This is a very serious problem, and so we need to think big about solutions for that problem. I'm not going to talk with you about the benefits of cover crops because you guys are the experts. I'm actually here to learn from you about the benefits of cover crops. But, but, uh, but I did uh, uh, do a, a little reading about it and have learned a little bit about it in various places. And one of the things that I think about it, in addition to the one about it um, having those economic benefits that I think can make it a real uh, driver, is that it, I think it will help for the future. It'll help for the droughts that I'm afraid are in our future. Uh, more often, uh, the kinds of circumstances that we're facing in so many parts of the country now. And so uh, I think it's an adaptive approach uh, as well as one that works for us today. So I want to set up this slide a little bit. It's about, um, uh, it's about the uh, EPA's nutrient strategy. There's actually a memo that's called the Stoner Memo that I signed. That's why it's called the Stoner Memo. Uh, and people talk about it a lot, I think, mostly because of the name Stoner, which I've gotten a lot of mileage out of over the years. Uh, but uh, but um, the, what it is about is, um, is setting up systematic approaches to addressing nutrient pollution. But I just wanted to step back just a little bit in terms of the clean water framework that, uh, that underlies this. So, uh, so, so the job I have is implementing the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, that's, that's what we do. And those are tools that are given to us by Congress through legislation. The Clean Water Act, uh, both of them are aging. The Clean Water Act hasn't been updated since 1987. Uh, so that's one of the challenges we have. But, uh, but the way the Clean Water Act works is through what's called cooperative federalism. So you have the EPA and the states working together. And the states really have the lead role almost every program under the Clean Water Act. They set water quality standards based on the uses of the waters. So what is it used for? Is it used as a drinking water source? Is it used as a recreational water? Is it used for fishing? Is it used for watering stock, irrigation, all those different kinds of things? And how clean does it need to be to make it safe for that use? So that's done by the states. And then they figure out what do we need to do 
to, uh, to have that water meet those standards and be safe. And there's two basic kinds of uh, entities under the Clean Water Act. There's point sources, that's like sewage treatment plants are point sources, industrial sources, big cities, those are point sources. And there's non-point sources, which is urban runoff outside of uh, big cities and row crops. Most important for our purpose here, row crops. Those are non-point sources. They are not regulated under federal law. So I just want to make sure that that sort of basic framework is understood by everybody in thinking about this. And so what this nutrient framework talks about is having uh, an approach where the state systematically looks at the different sources of nutrient pollution, the point and the non-point, and comes up for a strategy for each one. Uh, you know, what needs to be done about sewage treatment? What needs to be done about agriculture runoff? What needs to be done about septic systems? What needs to be done about stormwater runoff? And so the state devises the plan that works for them based on where the sources of pollution are, where the loads are, and how they can be most effectively reduced. So, uh, so one of the things that I do, and, and Jim mentioned this because uh, he's worked with us a long time on this, is, is co-chair the uh, hypoxia task force. So that right there is the whole Mississippi River Basin. And these are the states that are in the hypoxia task force. So it's 12 states, uh, and sometimes it's the environmental agency, sometimes it's the agriculture agency or the natural resource agency, five federal agencies and tribes. And, uh, and it's co-chaired right now by uh, the Secretary of Agriculture in Iowa, uh, Bill Northey. And, um, and we're working together to get these state nutrient reduction strategies in place for all the 12 states and to work together to figure out how to implement them to address not just the problem in the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, but nutrient pollution throughout the, throughout the states and how they affect people there. And it's, it's going well. I think um, eight of the states already have the strategies out, and we're expecting the other four uh, this year. And then this is what the federal agencies on the task force are focusing on, how we can support those state plans through monitoring, through research, through targeting of conservation practices. Uh, we're working very closely with NRCS on that one. Technical tools. Uh, to support decision-making by producers and uh, outreach partnerships and so forth. And then um, uh, we have a little bit of money. We don't have as much money as some people do, but uh, we have a little bit of money in the 319 program. Uh, the 2013 appropriation was $156 million. Uh, Congress actually increased that by $3 million to $159 million this year. And, um, and uh, that's a great program to help put practices uh, on the ground uh, and to do monitoring that some other programs can't do to make sure that we know what they're doing, what those practices are accomplishing. Uh, and uh, uh, there's also regional programs that EPA has. So as I say, there's 319, that's 159 nationwide. There's also a Great Lakes program, uh, which has almost $300 million. Uh, the Chesapeake Bay program, the Puget Sound program, the Long Island Sound program. If you're in the watershed of an estuary, there's the National Estuary Program. So there's lots of different ways to potentially get some funding through EPA. Again, we're not the big funder out there, but there may be money available. So uh, please talk with us if you want to know uh, more about that. And so um, one of the things <coughs> we put on our website is the 319 success stories we have. and um, the hallmark of the success stories is that you had a water that was a polluted, and then people came together and took action, voluntary action under the 319 program, and uh, the water was taken off the list as polluted and uh, is now usable. And that's uh, what this story is right here uh, on the uh, Alabama's Flint River. Um, and uh, it included winter cover crops and conservation tillage on 2,000 acres. Uh, the problem was dissolved oxygen. Uh, and. Uh, uh, now it's off the impaired list. So those are the kinds of success stories that we're very interested in, getting the word out about how people can use that program. Usually it's matched up with other funds uh, to get this good work done. So just in, in conclusion, you know, what we're interested in here is how we can be part of the solution, how we can work with people like you on growing cover crops. Because uh, 
I think we all know it's not going to work. It's not going to make that kind of change that we're looking for unless it's really done on a widespread basis. I'm very excited about having so many people working together, so many partners uh, to grow this, uh, figure out how it can work uh, for all of us together to achieve our common goals. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, that's why I'm here. I'm really happy to be here with all of you experts. And uh, here's how you can find us online. Uh, our Twitter account, uh, Facebook account, uh, uh, my email, stoner.nancy at epa.gov. Uh, let me know if there's anything uh, that I can do to help you with the good work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you.